<laughs> just wanting to do a quick acknowledgement of country. Um, QUT would like to acknowledge the Turbul and Yugger as the First Nations owners of the lands where we now stand. Uh, we pay respect to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits, and recognize that these places have always been uh, lands of teaching, research, and learning. Uh, QUT would like to um, recognize the continued cultural, spiritual, and um, genuine connections that Indigenous peoples have to this land. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome you all here today and uh, welcome you all from wherever you're joining us online. Great. Thanks, Sam. And we're very fortunate, actually, to have um, Sam, uh, who, who is an Indigenous man, um, uh, working at the Best Centre here. Okay, so I've got a QR code up. Um, I've got some sliders, so some interaction for people. So, you know, you don't say this often, but pull up your phone. So we'll have three in total. Coming. If this is the this is the reverse engineering. Uh, that's all right. Okay. If not, you can just go to Slido. Slido uh, so it's www.sli.do and type in reverse as the code. And that will get you into this as well. Okay, so let's go to our next slide, Sam. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so what discipline or field are you from? Just seeing who we've got in our audience. That's great. So clearly we've got quite a few from marketing. And another invitation for this went far and wide, so potentially beyond Australia as well. Right. Okay. So our dominant, our dominant uh, discipline is um, marketing. But you can see that we've got quite a, a bit of variety um, from other other fields coming in as well. It looks like we've also got people who are in the public sector uh, that's coming through. So very nice. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, it's a pretty broad approach. I've spoken about this to people from a variety of disciplines. It's not just about marketing. Uh, it's really more a process rather than, than content. So uh, it doesn't matter what discipline you're in, you can still use what I'm going to go through today um, in your own field. And you don't need it just for journal articles. You could do this with a thesis. Uh, you could do this with a report. Uh, you can do it for any kind of written documentation. So it's the same approach, just change the word, you know, how to reverse engineer up insert document um, so you can do this with anything and this is this is typically what I do when um, I'm doing uh, a new kind of written report um, or even if I'm doing something that's visual or an infographic uh, I use this approach as well so just give me a little bit of security when I'm um, heading into the realm of uncertainty okay well next slide uh, Sam okay so my background um, so I'm the editor uh, or co-editor of the Journal of Services Marketing. So we're the oldest services marketing uh, journal in the world. Um, there are others in the services space, but we're the first services marketing. Um, so um, uh, 1986, 1987, we launched. Uh, we've only had a couple of editors since then. So long-term editor, Charles Martin, and then I came in in 2014 with Steve Barron um, from Liverpool. And then um, Steve uh, retired and then was um, uh, succeeded by Mark Rosenbaum. Um, who a number of you know. And as you can see, the impact factor has gone from 0.9 um, to 5.24 in only seven years. Uh, and we've gone from a SkyMargo Q2 to a SkyMargo Q1, and it's an A rank in um, the Australian Business Dean's Council list. So it's a pretty strong um, journal. Next slide. Okay, so you can see our annual submissions, they are rising, um, hovering close to the 500 mark. Um, and I think we'll, we'll hit that this year. Uh, we publish between 70 and 75 articles a year. So you can see that the desk rejection rate is 50% and the rejection rate overall is about 85%. So if you get beyond the desk rejection with us, you've already got better than even odds um, of, um, of getting uh, getting accepted um, on that. And so the reason I'm telling you this is to frame, I guess, the discussion for today. So I'm coming not just as an author, but also as an editor. Next slide. Okay, so in our journal, if any of you are interested in the services area, um, we're interested in um, really cutting edge topics. Uh, we're willing to take a risk on papers. 
Um, so our little tagline is, uh, if it's interesting, it's in JSM. So we want to be the first in the conversation uh, and we will take a risk on papers. And we've had reviewers actually tell us in their feedback, you know, you're very bold, you know, taking this paper. And it's like, yep, that's exactly the kind of feedback that we want um, to, to hear from our reviewers. Um, and like all journals, you know, it's got to be rigorous, uh, well-written, uh, diverse range of methodological, uh, philosophical approaches. So all of those are pretty constant for any journal. And so that's the perspective that I'm coming at today is how do you do something that's um, not only rigorous and conceptually well-grounded, but also how do you do something that's interesting? Next slide. Uh, I've just put this one up. I'm not going to go through all the details. Um, this is pretty standard. Whenever I go to all the editors, everyone says the same thing, and it's always this. So I've left it in for those who want the slide deck. Um, so it's really applicable more broadly. Um, this is how to get a desk reject in one easy step. In the format, so Emerald publishers have a structured abstract. As soon as we see a paragraph, we know someone's not even read the instructions for an our authors. A lack of contribution, something that works, you know, for um, IMC or brand, if it's not um, a services contribution, you won't get up with this. And it doesn't matter if it's in banking, that's simply the context. So if the contribution is not true for the theoretical domain of the journal, you, you, you won't get through. And then finally, you look at rigorous style. This is pretty well the order that we use to assess whether a paper ever gets um, to an associate editor and, and goes out. Um, and so these are the kinds of things I'm going to talk about. And these are some easy, you know, low hanging fruit hits um, to make sure that your paper at least gets sent for review. Do come in, I can Okay, next slide. Okay, so why reverse engineer? So this is, you know, the world according to Rebecca. Um, so you notice there's no citations there. So it's all about discovering the methods for how to write this article, how to avoid a uh, blank page syndrome when you're sitting there and you're like, I don't even know where to start. It's all about efficiency. So why reinvent the wheel? Why spend lots and lots of time? Um, and that really relates to the next one, effective use of resources. I don't know about you, but I don't have endless amounts of time, money or self-esteem that I can spare. Um, <laughs> so I want to maximize my resources, both um, material resources and psychological resources. Um, and um, make sure that I've got my best shot uh, when submitting a paper report, whatever it might be, grant, it could be a great application. And so reverse engineering will help increase your likelihood of success. So I figure if it, you know, if it looks like a duck in the duck pond, then all the other ducks, i.e. reviewers, will accept it, right? So it's got to look like it fits right from the beginning. And so really this article, is, uh, this um, presentation is not so much about how do you come up with a scintillating contribution? That's a separate topic. This is how do you make sure that your paper meets all the requirements and conforms and looks like a duck so that it might be able to, you know, fly in the duck pond. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the proof that it works. This is um, uh, one of my colleagues um, who was my PhD student, um, and you can obviously see who it is because of the citation, so Cheryl Leo. So um, Cheryl was a quantitative researcher, did, had to, did call in her um, uh, PhD. And for anyone who's, you know, does qualify or trying to do the other side can be really, really challenging. And particularly with the write-up, the, the articles write up differently. They, they don't look the same, it's, it's just a different process. And so when we um, started with um, Cheryl's first study in her PhD, it was qualitative. And I wasn't much of a qualitative researcher, so it was the boring leading the blind. Um, Cheryl was a quantitative researcher from her honours, and so we needed something to help us uh, guide us through this process. And so what I did was I turned to a colleague's paper. So uh, Lloyd Harrison, Kate Reynolds, Kate Dort, as she is now, in 2003. Um, and so I went and found a paper that was full in a high rate journal that kind of did what I wanted to do. So I found the visual that matched where I thought we would need to go do. Now in their paper, what they had was the outcomes and uh, a typology of a behavior. What we were looking at was antecedents and it's no, you know, it's not unremarkable to see, it's a mirror image of each other. So when I saw their paper, I went, that's kind of what we want to do, but in reverse. And so that then gave me the structure for how to write up the analysis to match the framework. So with Paul, often the framework will arise out of the data with quantity frameworks in your like review and it leads into the data. So I needed a way of pulling this stuff together. 
So uh, with Cheryl in her thesis, um, it was the first chapter, it was a supporting sort of study, and so it was themes. So we had to convert themes into something that was a framework. One of the things that you find in top journals is you don't, you can't get away with just reporting a whole bunch of themes in your analysis and then say, you know, you did review, you'll go figure out how they're re uh, related to each other. So we needed to convert from the thesis into this. And so this is how we did it. Um, and it got published in the Journal of Marketing Management uh, as a result. So we were pretty happy with that. So it does work. And I've used this whenever I go for a new journal or work with um, a, a new research team. Next slide. Okay, so these are my seven steps. You know, you might have them in different orders yourself. Um, some of you will be, you know, find that you go, yes, this is already what I do. Um, this is the approach that I find works. This is an approach. Now, you're going to hate this if you think it's a bit of a factory line approach to, um, to research. And I've got to say, that is exactly what it is. Okay, because in many ways, we are a knowledge factory, just producing stuff, trying to get stuff out. The hard part is trying to maintain the joy in what you do and um, staying true to yourself in your, with, with it. So I'm not talking about what you're writing. I'm talking about the writing process itself. And if you talk to authors of novels, you'll find that there is still an underlying structure and a process. You talk to painters. So even in the creative industries, there are still techniques and processes that are used to underpin um, the process. And so while you can have creativity in writing, you don't need to have it in this process. Um, do it around the content, not, not the process. So that would be my suggestion. So if you hate it, I'm sorry. Um, this is also not the only way to write, but it is a way to write, particularly when you're doing something for the first time um, or when you're feeling like you've got a lot of, you, you feel a great sense of uncertainty about how to put this thing together. So I do not do it in every article, but I do it in a lot of articles, particularly um, an unfamiliar journal to me. Okay, so let's go through each of the steps. Uh, and sometimes I do this se uh, seminar like over uh, a day. And so one of the things that you can do when we have the video is to stop and start it and actually kind of play along. And so each step, you might, each step could take you a couple of hours. It could take you a couple of days or a couple of weeks. And so you just stop and start the video. And um, if you do it that way, it will be easier to actually produce something um, at the end rather than just watch it and then continue on. But use it how you will. Okay, so we have another uh, slide. It should be the same link. Yep. I just popped it in the chat for Zoom people as well. Yep. So uh, which step do you think or do you find typically is the most difficult for you? Um, is it picking the target journal? Is it understanding what's required? Is it deconstructing uh, an example article? Uh, is it adding your own content? Is it identifying relevant papers to cite? So just seeing where people have the problem typically. And then for you guys, as you become, you know, as, as you've got a self-awareness of where is your uh, pain point, um, you can really focus in on that uh, with, um, with the presentation. So we can see that it's the deconstruction phase so far. How many participants have we got? So we've got 70 online. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it looks like deconstructing the example article, and that's good because that's where most of um, today's talk is going to focus. Okay, let's move on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the deconstruction phase. So you can see there we have our Lego blocks. What we all see when we read a journal article is the finished house, the, the beautiful product. What we're not seeing is the tip that was formed, you know, as part of it, or the number of times things had to be redone, um, and all the rubbish that got left behind. And obviously, it's this lovely manicured lawn and the house, and we're all like, oh, that's really lovely. Um, what we don't see is the graveyard of all the papers that never made it. I actually have a folder called um, the um, publication graveyard of papers that I just did not find out. <laughs> but guess what? If you come back to them 10 years later and collect new data, it's then a longitudinal study. So just a tip, you know, nothing's really ever dead. You know, the zombie arises. Okay, so uh, pick your target. So this is the, you know, this, this is typically the, the best place to start. Now, I want you to think yourself, and I'll ask the room here, 
do you design your research around the requirements in the journal, A, or do you find the journal where your research will fit, B? So who does A? Who finds the journal first? Okay, who writes it and goes, right, what are we gonna publish? Okay, so you're so your product in search of a market. So what do we call that in marketing terms, people? What orientation is that? We've built the product. Now we have to find somewhere to, to flog it. Yeah, product, product or production orientation. Guess what we learn in marketing about that? Does that work? No. no. Okay, so the marketing should work. We're not even marketing ourselves properly. Okay, so if we were in marketing and we were marketing our knowledge, we go, what do the customers want? What is it that I can do to satisfy that need? And then we would develop our product. Like, well, that's how this works. This is a marketing angle. But yeah, how often do we just write it and then go, well, where do we want to do it? And in fact, if you do that, it's unlikely you're going to hit the top, the top A star journals, right? Because they have specific requirements. I remember in general consumer research in the in the nineties and early two thousands when I was doing my my stuff. Um, if you didn't have uh, perceived risk as a control variable or involvement, particularly, you weren't going to get published because everything was all about involvement, right? And if you didn't read the journal and you didn't know that, then you would send your paper off and they'd be like, "Well, oh, I can see you've uh, missed uh, involvement as the covariate or as the control variable at reject, right? You would know that." if you'd read the journal before that. So each journal kind of has its little nuances and tweaks and ways of doing things um, and methodologically, mm -hmm. and you need to make sure you know that before you start, because if you screw up with the data collection, there's not a lot of ways back from that. You can fix positioning, you can't fix method unless you go and recollect data, and that's time and money that you really don't want to have to do. Next slide. Okay, so once you've sorted out your target journal, um, you need to go read it. It sounds crazy. But read the author requirements. Honestly, as an editor of JSM, the number of times I have stuff that I will desk reject because it doesn't even meet the basics. I'll get a 20 word title, right? Ours is nine to 10 words, give or take, right? And I do not like titles that have every word in your model that's in it as well. Just that there's, there's, there's a tip, right? I like snappy titles uh, because in this day of, you know, headlines and only a few character spaces, what people read is what they see in that title. Um, I have a question online. Did you want me to save it to the end? It kind of relates to a point you made previously. No, please ask it. Um, so we have a question from Cassandra. She said, doesn't the journal-oriented approach assume we care more about publishing in certain journals rather than doing research that matters to us or our area? Also, what happens when you orient the whole research around a target journal and then you get a reject or, God forbid, a desk reject then? Mm, yeah, okay. Look, in a perfect world, I'd say we should be able to do our own research and then find the appropriate place for it. That's a perfect world. Um, we don't live in a perfect world. Um, if you're on the job market and you're or you're on contract or you're wanting promotion, you have to play the game to a certain extent. And this is where you've got to take a step back and say, what is it that I'm willing to do to play that game? And what is it that I'm going to do to stay true to myself? So I've got my little fringe topics and I will publish in a Q2 or a Q3 rank journal if I think it's appropriate. But I'm only allowed to have a couple of those by my institution. So it's really, what is it you're going to be rewarded or punished for in your institution? Because the bottom line is you need a job and you need promotion. So you do have to be strategic about what you do, but you've also got to stay true to yourself. And that's really a little personal journey. It depends on where you are. When I started, we didn't have journal ranking lists, so nobody really cared. It was a journal. Yeah, you would do. No one cared. It matters now. As a professor now, I can have the luxury of doing a few of my own fringe things and doing what I want. But I still have requirements and I still have reporting. So I think it's, you've got to work out yourself. How much do you want to play the game? Don't sell your soul. Um, do have those projects that are really important and get out. But bear in mind that there are consequences for every decision that you make. And I have colleagues who've done it exactly their own way and have never managed to get a job outside of their institution and have never been promoted. So there is no right and wrong. Um, in a perfect world, we should be able to just do the science and publish where we feel it's fit, but that's just not how it works. And unfortunately, I don't get to make the rules of the game. So you kind of got to play within it. Um, if you are aiming for a top journal and you don't make it, typically you've ticked all the bases for all the ones underneath it anyway. Um, but yes, you do need to reframe and reposition. And that's my little graveyard where I've tried that multiple times and it's failed. Um, and sometimes the market's just not ready for what you want to say. I've had papers that has taken years to get through and then suddenly 
it's 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 on brand, it's on topic, and you just got to stick with it. Um, revisit things, bring it back up, but don't ignore reviewers' comments because what they're telling you is they're not seeing the fit, they're not seeing the position. There's no market product fit, and you've got to work out well. It's how you're communicating it. So sometimes it's not the problem is the research. It's the way that you're communicating. And so you do have to take those seriously um, and sort of take it on the chin. And sometimes it's just simply not the right fit. You know, you might want to be in that journal, but if that journal doesn't think that you're on the conversation, then um, then don't do it. The other way that you get around editors is find special issues in that same journal, because if you know that a special issue editor is a particular fan of a topic area that maybe there's not, that's another good way to get in your journal. Uh, and I've done that in some journals where I know the editor's not a fan of what I do. Um, kind of know that because we're a bit emailed. Uh, but I've still published in the journal with the guest editors because it's the guest editor that makes the call and the scope is already set. So for instance, some journals don't like social marketing stuff. They don't like social topics. Um, so unless the special issue is on that, then I've got no chance. So I look out for those special issues. So yeah, I guess as a pragmatic response, Cassandra, um, you kind of got to know where your own line is and um, dance to the beat of your own drum, but be aware that there are consequences for some of these decisions and just be, just be careful would be my advice. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really depends on how stable your job position is uh, because at the moment it's still an employer's market. Um, you know, we're not in control as academics. Okay, so um, all of the reports. So this is Jams, uh, one of the top journals in marketing. Um, I had a look actually yesterday, and uh, these aims are still the case. They've so been the same for over a decade. So, one of the things here is you look at it and go, oh, yeah, I don't see that. But the difference in the detail here. So, for my real audience here, what is a substantive issue? What does that mean, that phrase? So, you look at it and go, oh, yeah, it's a substantive issue. Yeah, but what does that mean? What does the editor mean by that? Any ideas? Currently, which, like you were saying, um, maybe it's not the right time in. Yeah, and it's it's a strong problem. It's a strong problem area, and I interpret that as being um, in the real world. You know, something's going on as a phenomena that theoretically we can't um, explain. And these top journals don't want you know no paper and service quality, brand loyalty, or satisfaction. They want to be the first to invent the term satisfaction. So the first paper of satisfaction will get up and it's all not because they want it to be new and first and really substantive. So if you want to get in these top journals, you've got to observe the phenomena that is happening in the real world that is not in any way explained by the current theories. Or it could also be an old theory that has just been kicked on its head because of some you know, massive change. So you can revisit, but that, that's a tough call. So they want to have new stuff. And, um, you know, the other one is fundamentally new insights. Well, what is that? It's not adding a variable to a model or saying, oh, I found some boundary conditions. That is not what this journal considers new. So you have to get a really strong understanding of what is new. And we all know that putting blue, you know, blue dots or um, extra cleaning agents into the OMO is a new product, but that's not really as new as, oh, we've invented the internet, right? There are degrees of newness. These top journals want new new. Okay, if you don't, I'm not sure what that means, you have to go and have a look. And that's what this session's all about. So if you think your, your research fits the journal, then you commence. If not, realistically, go find another journal. Don't waste your time and the reviewer's time. And don't send it just to get the feedback. Okay? Because that we can spot that as an editor. It's like your name goes on our little list going, we're not going to be used just with your feedback machine. Okay, you've got to give it a decent shot. Okay, so the next thing that I do is to say, find an exemplar article. And this is not an exemplar article on the content on your topic. This is an exemplar article on the method. And the reason I say the method is because the method shapes the positioning and where you put the words. So if you're doing a qualitative piece, the whole structure of the article is quite different with your headings and your language to a quantitative piece because you don't have hypothesis. Um, you're not setting up an a priori argument. The structure of the tables in your uh, results is different. So find someone that has used your same, preferably analytical technique, and that's the gem, that's the goal. And I try and find a couple of pieces so that I can see what is common. I'm looking for, does this journal allow a lot of variation in the way things are presented? Or is there like an implicit little rule that only the people in the club know? 
And that's what we're looking for is these tacit implicit rules that nobody tells you, but that all the experts kind of know. Okay, and that's what we're, we're reading for, that tacit knowledge. doesn't matter what the content is. In fact, find the thing that you find the least interesting because then you can see through the content to see the structure that, you know, that is invisible and lies underneath. The other reason I'd say avoid your topic areas is because you don't want to unintentionally plagiarize um, what's in that article by, by being too close to it. So find something super boring that you just, you read, you're seeing through the, the words. And so, for instance, if you were in the 12th century and you wanted to publish, um, this is what you would be looking for. So you, the requirements would be big capital letter, uh, color, Latin, parchment. If you're in the 19th century and you're publishing, it'd be, you know, the, the printing press has been invented at this point. So you'd have lots and lots of different fonts, because you can. Um, direct quotes, black and white. So you would not submit a 19th century manuscript layout to the 12th century and vice versa. You could see immediately if that arrived on the editor's desk, they'd be like, what? It doesn't even look like it belongs. Okay, so use that same approach. We're wanting it to look like it fits in the dark form. Okay, so what we're then do, going to do is deconstruct the exemplar article. So if we think of what reverse engineering is, uh, and if you Google it, you find it's mainly applied to physical objects. It doesn't often get applied to um, the um, knowledge industry, but you can use it. So interestingly, if you Google reverse engineering in UFO, this comes up. Now, what is the one problem, do you think, with trying to reverse engineer a UFO? You don't have a starting point. <laughs> you don't have a starting point. <laughs> you actually don't have a UFO to be able to reverse engineer it. So your starting point is really, really critical. But I tell you what, after reading that article, I reckon I could reverse engineer a UFO. There were blueprints in everything. So I was, it was very compelling um, reading. Okay, so we've got eight. Uh, eight things that we look for when we deconstruct, and we're going to whiz through these. So this is the playback this video later and set it up yourself. What I would suggest that you do is open up a Word document and you play along, but not right now because you're never going to keep up. Okay, so the first thing you do is start with your heading structure. This immediately overcomes um, white page syndrome. So what I'm looking for when I'm redoing this is I'm looking for how many heading levels. Is it two heading levels deep? Is it three? Four is too many. You're going four heading levels deep, you're too deep in. So I pull back, pull back. Okay, you've got to come back up a, a level. What you do is you type up the headings that they've got in the journal article, in the report, in the thesis, and then you look at how many words are in each section. So I export a HTML version so that I can just do a word count in Word. Okay. And then what I will do is with my exemplar articles, go, is there a range here, say for the introduction? Does it is it towards that 800 and 1500 words or are they always about the same words? And then what I do is I annotate up my open, newly open Word document where I've got introduction, and then I insert a comment and I'll say um, ideal or exemplar, 800 words. And so I mock it all up like that. That's also very helpful for co-authors so that they don't go overboard and then you've got, you're just about to submit, you're like, oh crap, I do want the words over. Let me tell you, you never go to the word count when you submit. Because reviewers never ask you to take stuff out. They always ask you to add more. So rule of thumb, try and be under the word count when you submit the first time because you're going to have a hell of a time when you get the revision back. Um, and they don't tell you what to take out. It's like, well, it's up to you. So, you know, try and be under that word count because you never get asked to remove or always asked to add. And what you're looking for is where is the emphasis in the paper? And this will depend on your journal and discipline. So in marketing, we seem to spend an awful lot of time in the setup. And then we go, oh, by the way, here's what was better. Uh, other, other journals, it's really different. So in health, it's like introducing their method. It's like there's no limit with you. Everything's the intro. And I really, I'm like choking as I read it, going, oh, but I want to say so much. It's just not how it's done. They're like 5,000 word papers compared to marketing that's nine or 12,000 word papers. So you're trying to go, where is the emphasis in the paper? When I went to an emotions conference a number of years ago, it was, um, I like this global conference about all things emotion and it was every discipline. And there were people who self identified as a philosopher. So, so yeah, I'm a philosopher. And I'm like, whoa, okay, right, I have a PhD, but I don't ever say that. So, we had philosophers right through to marketers. And the philosophers didn't use PowerPoint, they actually had a piece of paper that they had photocopied and handed out. It was like you poetry. Um, so, I sat there just like my knees crossed, just cringing, going, I don't even know what people are trying to say. The philosophers didn't get to the point until the end 
Whereas I was like looking for, so what are you going to tell me? So in the end, I just retreated back to my corner and went to only the presentation by the psychologists and the business people because that was where I was most familiar. So my um, uh, risk aversion sort of bias started playing out. But what I noticed is that psychologists have a tiny bit in the beginning and then they spend lots of time telling you what the findings are. Marketers would be the dead opposite. Philosophers, well, you're still trying to figure out what the point is, which is maybe the point that they're trying to make is, well, what is life? What am I trying to say? Right at the end. Um, there is also an east-west bias in our writing. So in the West, we will say, here's what we're going to say. Here's my point. Then you say the point. Then you say, here was my point. Just in case you missed it for the three times I already told you. What I find um, with more Eastern writing is that it's a story and it's a narrative and the, you know, the, the point reviews itself at the end. But typically, if you're publishing in a Western journal, it's not a murder mystery. We want to know that the butler did it with the dagger in the ballroom, right from the abstract all the way through. So you've got to know your journal and you've got to know how to write and what the style is. Okay. Next slide. Okay, and that brings me to style. Okay, so for me, I like quirky titles. I want snappy titles that catch attention. Some editors absolutely hate that. And you can easily tell because you look at the last couple of years and you can see what the titles are. If it's a boring title, well, that's kind of what you're going to go. Take a risk if you want, but, you know, try and, again, fit within things. Um, and you, you've really got to know it helps if editors write um, editorials and tell you exactly what they want. We do in our journal, but not all do. I look at the language style. Is it US? Is, um, is it um, um, what sort of English? Does it? Passive and uh, versus active. I got a paper desk rejected three times by Journal of Business Research when Art Woodside was the editor uh, because he didn't like my, he thought I was being too passive in my tone in the abstract. So I rewrote that abstract multiple times. In the end, it did get published. Um, so turn on your little active voice checker in Word. It's not automatic. You've got to go into the grammar and you've got to turn it on um, so that you can, you can see what it is. <laughs> and readership age. Has anyone ever calculated the readability of their writing? I actually have, yeah. Okay, excellent, Sam. Can you just click? Because yeah. everyone's got some animations. Okay, so I use the Flesh Kincaid um, index. The higher the score, the more readability it is, okay? Um, and what you can do is take a chunk of your text. The more text you've got, the better and more accurate the score. And you stick it into a reading index calculator. I've got a hyperlink um, that's there, or you just Google, there's heaps out there. And it will tell you how old you need to be. Uh, to read um, your work. Uh, if you publish in a conversation, they do this automatically. Mm -hmm. They've got a traffic light system. Essentially, it's about the number of syllables in your words and the number of words in your sentence. So if you ever get feedback from your supervisor or a problem that says, you're writing too dense, right? It means cut your sentences down, put some full stops in and use words with less syllables. That's how you do it. And you do the same with the conversation. Um, and they do it deliberately in the conversation. They're aiming at the, the um, 13 to 15 year olds, uh, or actually 11 is typically the average leadership age. There's another animation there. So this is the Fledge Kincaid grade level. Um, so you can see that an academic paper is normally at the highest um, academic level, and then it's got books. So if you're writing a book and you want to appeal to different audiences, you can stick a chunk of it in. Um, you can even take an existing journal article and go, what is the readership age? Find an article you like that you think is easy to read, copy and paste it in and go, that's what I want to aim for. I want that, that, that ease of writing. Um, so this is really good just to do a self-check about how hard is your work to read, do your thesis. Um, you want to make it uh, easy to read. Making complex topics accessible is part of our job. Okay, um, we don't have to prove how smart we are because we can use similar, you know, uh, words with three syllables and use 10 words when instead of using two. It's not dumbing it down, it's making it accessible for a variety of audiences. Okay, contribution. So this is where do we put it and how do we put it? Um, so what you're looking here for in your exemplar article is how is the contribution framed and where do they put it? So some people will put the contribution at the end of the introduction. Other journals will just leave it in at the end. You, if the journal does it in a variety of ways, then you've got free choice, do it however you want. But then an individual reviewer can come back and say, oh, but I really want you to summarize the contribution at the end of the introduction. Um, there's no rule of thumb, just see what the journal does and follow whatever that practice is. If you've scoped the research, so you've got delimitations, 
you know, you're doing um, women off the nurse. Well, why did you do women? What did you do men? You kind of got to justify and say, yeah, okay, so this paper is limited to women who are aged 25 to 45 in Australia, you know, who enjoy men, whatever it might be. And what you've done earlier in the introduction is you've justified that, but sometimes you need to specify that scope so that people don't get little surprises later in the paper. Again, have a look at how do they do that. And bearing in mind that the more you delimit or scope the research, the more narrow that contribution. So if the journal is a, a very broad general journal, they don't mind that you use a particular context, but they want you to be able to extrapolate from that context, you know, in a, in a, in a broader way uh, to, to meet their audience. And that's sometimes where papers get rejected because it might be that you're making a contribution to the banking industry, but if you're going into a services journal, we need other people, not just people in banking, to understand. So sure, use banking, use museums, use retail, but you use it as an example of a certain type of service to illustrate a certain theoretical point. And so as you've now got your structure in your Word document, you start to note in the paragraphs, add contribution here, put scope here, you're adding the notes to yourself. So when you go to write um, and you go, I've got half an hour, I've got to write something, I might dive in and just write my scope. So you don't have to write in a linear way once you've got that structure. You can dive in and out depending on your motivation levels and the time that you've got available. Next slide. Okay, um, what I also use for contribution is Bloom's taxonomy. So um, probably can't tell the participants, but can you give me a thumbs up uh, online if any of you have ever used Bloom's taxonomy to figure out your contribution? Anyone in the room? Yep. Um, yeah, many thumbs up. There's a couple of notes, a couple of shocked faces. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, lovely emoji. Thank you, people. Okay, so Bloom's taxonomy we normally use to design assessment, right? Um, I studied teaching, primary school teaching in a former a former life. After I taught grade threes, realized that I wasn't cut out for cleaning up after the children got too excited. Um, so now I teach older people. Um, but <laughs> information you can't ever argue. Okay, so Bloom's taxonomy goes from, and there's there's different domains. This is the cognitive domain. And basically it goes from the easy stuff to the hard stuff. And when we develop assessment, we try and assess at different levels of complexity. So multi-choice sort of definition questions are sort of at the bottom level. Um, essay or comparative sort of stuff um, is at the higher level. And so if you're thinking about contribution, coming up with a list of here are the 10 factors that make entrepreneurs successful, that's not much of a theory of contribution because you've done it in like one paragraph. Here's 10 things, great. Well, what's the rest of the chapter going to be all about? Okay, so the higher up the ladder on Bloom's taxonomy that you can be, the stronger your contribution is. Okay, so you can use that as a bit of a self check about where is your contribution and look at the verbs. If you click on that link or Google Bloom's taxonomy, you get a heap of words underneath each of those. So if you've ever got to say in your paper, my contribution is that I'm bloody, bloody, blah, blah, you don't say it's about understanding something, right? You actually say it's about creating a new framework, it's about evaluating blah, 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 or there's plenty more verbs that you can go and look for. So if you're struggling to really articulate your contribution with a powerful word, go to Bloom's Taxonomy, something will jump out, or you go, I'm not articulating this at the highest possible level. Something. So those top two, creating and evaluating, are probably where you need to be in an A-star journal in any kind of discipline. Okay, so purpose and key frameworks. Just keeping a bit on time here. Okay, so what you're doing here and you're noting up your Word document here is, what is the goal and the aim of the research? Okay, most journals actually want you to say, so the purpose of this paper is why, and you need to use the word purpose because it's a purpose statement. Don't go and change that purpose statement in your contribution section, copy and paste it. When I reversed engineer to Jam's article, I was like, oh my God, it's the same sentence. I didn't notice that because I've read all the bits in between. If you've got a purpose, you don't rephrase it. You just stick with it, right? Make it clear, it's one sentence. Sometimes repetition works. Think advertising, people, frequency of exposure. But you want to know where do you put it. Different journals will put this in different places. So again, if you've got a couple of exemplar journals and they're all putting it in the introduction, then that's where you put it as well. You need to know how is theory used in the front section of the paper compared to how it's used to develop whatever the purpose of the paper is. In marketing, 
Historically, we use it to identify the problem or the gap. Theory again, to actually design our instruments. So we're using it in two completely different ways, backward looking and forward looking. And typically the theories that, are, uh, that have been done are not the ones we then take into our research. So you need to see how do they do that? Do they do it? Um, in some disciplines, um, from a marketing academic, I'm looking at it goes a bit my way. It's not much theory. Well, that's just my opinion as a marketer because we, we tend to have a very heavy on theorizing what we are trying to do based on existing literature. Um, and what are the seminal papers in the field? You need to have them in the first two paragraphs. How do we know something seminal? You can pop into the chat. Anyone in the room? By a citation count. Uh, yep, but a reviewer's not going to go searching. So mm -hmm. how, how does a reviewer know when they're reading just from your paper that you've included the set? There's a couple of, there's two ways. One's pretty obvious. Probably the author of the magazine. It could if be. If the author has written the, the seminal study, then most journals would cite that to the author consistently. The review will know that the seminal piece is, but typically you can say the seminal paper in this field, it can be literally <laughs> that obvious, right? Okay, just in case you don't know, here's the seminal paper. So that's a really easy one. The other one is just look at the year. If someone's citing 1965, 1973, 1932, that are pretty well better be the seminal piece, otherwise, why on earth are you citing something that old, right? So they're they're the giveaways, they're the little clues that you're sprinkling through the paper so that the reviewer knows you've done your due diligence, that you know the backstory. Um, I did history at uni when I first started. I've got a really strong appreciation of chronology and history. You do need to position the piece. Oh, this field is 50 years old, starting with you know Richard Oliver and blah blah blah. Okay, good. That's two lines you've taught, you've shown me. You know that there's, there's a backstory going on here. Sometimes if the paper is all about trying to unify the literature, you might have a lot more in your lit review, but you need to demonstrate that you know that there is a history. Or mm -hmm. hey, this is 35 years old. You know, starting with Russell Bennett in you know 2018. Blah blah. blah. Okay, so immediately I know that you know. Really easy things, and um, it starts to set the scene of the paper. Okay, logic and structure. So how are you going to build the logic? And this is where you've got to get things in the right order. And sometimes this is super tough to do. I do up a logic tree, and I do it with post-it notes. And anyone who knows me knows I love my post-it notes, especially the 3 inversions versions, because they don't fall off the wall. So what I do is try and put one sentence that's each of my key points in my article, and I put it in an, uh, the post-its in an order. And then I have to move them around and then I verbalize and say, okay, so folks, you know, I'm going to, do, you know, as captain of the bank the baby team. And so I'm going to tell you that blah, and then blah, and then blah. And if it makes no sense to say it out loud, then I've got the logic order wrong. This is important because it tells you where you need to start and what you need to explain first. And once you've got the logic order of your concepts, you stick with it throughout the paper. The way you introduce the concepts in the intro is the same as the lit review, it's the same as in the method, it's the same as in the results, et cetera, et cetera. So typically you have research question one first then research question two next or even three. And so you've got to have a level of order in that and you don't mix it up through the article. Mm -hmm. trying to figure out is where is my starting point? Do you start with your focal construct? Do you start with the outcomes of your focal construct? Do you start with the antecedent? Like if you've got to figure out where do you want the emphasis in this paper? And please don't make it on purchase intentions. I've got to say that is the one dependent variable I super hate because intentions don't typically predict behavior and no one's interested in how to purchase intentions work. So there's a tip, don't ever put it in your title in a marketing journal. No one cares about purchase intentions particularly, um, but it's easy and everyone uses it. So don't tell me in half a page how purchase intentions work, right? Know the journal. So you need to rearrange it. If you find as you're writing that you're having to talk about something before you've introduced it, that's telling you immediately you've got a logic problem. But rather than be writing, you just dot point it out in sentence structure in your intro. That immediately tells you if there's a problem. Read it out aloud. If it doesn't work, move it around. But once you've got it set, that is that is it. So I always write at the purpose of each section in my Word um, document. And if you're really struggling with the intro, I do the purpose of each paragraph. And I used to make students do this with their thesis, and I would get them to put it in red and say, the purpose of this section is to convince Rebecca that dot 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 
And then I'd read that. So that when I read their paragraph and it made no sense to me, I could figure out, okay, I know what you're trying to say. You're not doing it well. Here's how to fix it. If I don't know what you're trying to say and I'm a reviewer, I can't tell you how to fix it, right? So you've kind of got to make it obvious that you've got to know yourself and you need your co-authors to know. So and I go and rearrange your sentences. I find the most time I spend with my co-authors is working out the logic structure. What are we trying to say? What's our argument? What's our narrative? And then it's easy to say, all right, you go away and put that table and you go write this bit because then we're all singing from the same thing book. But write it out, document it. Um, synthesis technique. So how does the exemplar literature synthesize the literature? I have a whole bunch of um, articles that use different visuals to synthesize the literature. So I've seen some do like a quadrant where they'll say there's two key um, fundamental concepts that come together in this literature and they've got all the references in each quadrant and remarkably one quad quadrant is blank. Oh, look, no one's done anything there. And guess what? That's what we're going to do. And I saw that in Jan's article. And as soon as you see that picture, you know immediately what's been done and what where this paper's positioned. It was fabulous. Um, and mind map, there might be you know, a lot in this circle. We've got a lot in this circle, but no one's looked at the overlap. And this overlap is important because blah, 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 it relates to our managerial problem. So it saves a lot of words. Remember, there's, um, I think in most journals are already 250 words. Um, you can stack a lot in a, in a visual. Uh, you can do web appendices uh, with tables. So how do they synthesize in a way that's really efficient with the words? Do they have pictures? Some journals won't use pictures at all. Other journals will just use them a lot. What is your own style that you want to do? I personally prefer pictures. Um, I think a picture tells a thousand words and I'm a visual learner. So it's a personal preference of mine. Have a look at what everyone else is doing and get ideas. So I've got like an ideas bank. I also use smart art. I know it sounds really basic, but if I'm struggling to go, how do I, how do I show the relationship in mind, you know, map the literature, I'll just open up smart art, start looking at things and go, oh, there's an inspiration source. And then I use that idea. I also use it when I do my poll research about how I want to bring things together. So don't underestimate the power of a good little smart art um, visual to give you like the kicking off point to do your own synthesis of the literature. But again, have a look in the journals, also look in the top journals in the field and get inspiration from that. So I have all these inspiration journals for when I'm a bit stuck to, that I can go to, to, to kind of move me along in the same way artists will look for inspiration, you know, in different places. Conventions. So there are rules, implicit rules. So for instance, there are ways to put a hypothesis. So if you're doing an ANOVA hypothesis, it's very different to a regression hypothesis. And I know this because I hate doing ANOVA hypothesis. Um, having three variables in a, in a phrase always just is like a mind flip to me. And so what I do is I copy the hypothesis from a really good journal, and then I type over their variables and go IV1, IV2, DV, and then I can overlay mine and I use their verbs. Okay, and also don't change your own over hypothesis with the word in every second hypothesis. You don't have to be creative with it. Stick to one conventional way of saying it. Uh, how do they phrase the proposition? Don't phrase a proposition like a hypothesis. Uh, how do they do this in this journal? Uh, you can even draw up the results before you've even got the results in terms of tables. My PhD supervisor got me to do that with uh, my structural equation modeling thesis, you know, way back. Uh, and I had all my tables all drawn up while I was waiting for my data to come in. All I have to do is just pop all the results in and I could see how to phrase it. You know, yep, I'm going to report my sample this way. Um, I'm going to describe my analysis technique this way. Here's my little table. I can fill in all the blanks later when I've got my SPSS or SEM um, output. Um, harder for Qual to do this, uh, but where you've got like a convention, you follow it down to this table has lines going this way and not that way. They have notes in, you know, eight point font in italics. You follow that convention. You want it to look like it belongs in the duck pond. But don't format it like the published journal. We don't do columns or anything like that. I've had people format it so it looks like the finished version. It's not follow the author instructions. It's typically double spaced, 12 point font, um, no comic sentence, please. Really hard to read. And you, add, you, you list all this out and you put your examples again back into your Word document. Next. Okay, so you've done all that. This could have taken you weeks or months. Um, and now we're going to reconstruct. Now you put your own stuff over it. So there is no, you, you want to be creative with the content. Okay, that's where your intellect comes in. 
So you go back to your draft structure. So there's more UFO, um, hardware UFO blueprint on there already. <laughs> See, it does exist. Um, and so I now start to draft it up. And guess what? You no longer have great page syndrome. You've actually got four or five pages of really good notes. So you know what your headings are. You know the approximate number of words. You know the purpose of each section. You start to now craft your own um, logic. You know the keyword you're going to use for each paragraph. You know how you're going to word a hypothesis or proposition. If um, you need, to, you know where your gap and research question is. Top and tail. Your intro should mirror your contribution. Your intro is all about here's my big problems in the industry or in uh, my discipline, and then in your uh, contribution, and here's my big answer. When I mark a thesis, I read the first and last chapters one after the other to see if they're mirror images of each other. When you're writing, we typically leave the um, discussion till the end. Why then you're pretty well out of steam. Don't ever start doing your discussion after you've already done three or four hours work on the paper. Start fresh, read your intro and go straight to your discussion. That's the best way of having a strong discussion so that it matches and needs to be at that same level of thought so that you've crafted your introduction 10 times. Don't just do one draft of the discussion and go, oh, I've got no more steam left. Um, I'm going to submit it anyway. That's the one that where you can always fall down. You've already worked out your language and you know your conventions. Next slide. So now you're adding your own topic. So now you type over the heading to put your headings. You put your research topics. You put heading level two and three in there. And this is where you're getting your logic coming through. What is your contribution? Dot pointed in. You're still in the dot point mode. You're not writing because if you've got co-authors, you do need to agree. What is our contribution? What's our narrative? You might have all of this data, but you don't shove it all in the journal article because that's 10 journal articles worth in one paper. What is it that you can reasonably craft that fits the positioning of the journal that is a nice, tight story? It's a bit like going to Europe, writing a whole bunch of diaries, and then you come back and you decide, oh, I'm going to write a book. Well, the book is not, here's my trip to Europe in chronological order of every single day and every single thing I did, right? You're selecting, you're picking quotes out, you're picking places out. You might decide to make it a foodies journey across Europe. So then you're only talking about the food experiences. So you've got all this data, does not all have to end up in the journal article. One thing that I, and I'll put a QR code here, the Manchester University Praise Bank is an awesome resource. If, 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 and this is for all disciplines. So if you're sitting there going, I don't know how to start the first line of my contribution, click on this and they've got a whole section of starter sentences, how to get started and how to say things in different ways. They've got it for the introduction, they've got it for lip reviews, they've got it for results, they've got it, and like it is an extensive list across different disciplines of how to get started. It's like finish the sentence, like word association games. Have a look and then you're going to be like, where have you been all my life? Okay, so if you find that you use the same phrases over and over, and you need a bit of variation or your stuff just cannot get started, go to the Manchester University Phrase Bank. Super awesome. And I've got the code um, to take you there. You need to think about who to cite. Now, this is contentious. So some articles like psychology and marketing will say you have to cite our journal, right? They're that explicit in the author instructions. Most uh, journals don't do it, but it is considered polite to consider a conversation in a journal, right? And frankly, if you're going to do something on a topic, it's very likely that whoever's written in that journal and a topic is going to be your reviewer and they get the shits when you haven't actually been, you're not aware of what's in the journal itself, okay? Um, it's not considered appropriate to direct people as a reviewer to your own work and that's really hard when you know you're the only person who has done something on this. So there's a bit of an ethical dilemma as a reviewer. The way I get over that is to say, look, I really think that you should do an extensive search on using these keywords in these journals. You may find something appropriate to cite. And I'll just leave it out there and go, well, if they do, they do. If they don't, they don't. So I never tell people, Russell Bennett, you know, you should go and look for her. Um, I might indicate my co-authors, but I, I always say, I suggest it, right? But if someone suggests it, typically they're saying, there's stuff out there you, you, you've actually missed. And I do actually demand that people cite other authors that I know are in this area. But if you haven't done your homework to see who's talked about this topic in this journal, that's just sloppy work. It really, it really is. And it's just not strict, very strategic. So read the articles, work out if you should cite them, okay? It doesn't mean you should, but you've at least got to go and look and make sure that you make an active choice to ever include or exclude them or critique them or not. Don't be ignorant. Of, of this this is that's just and the editor knows who they've cited recently who's published recently and 
When you get a revision, go back over it because it could be an article that's just come out that's doing something really close to you, and that's you, you need to be aware of it. It's a shame, but try not to take too long in the process because you don't want to have this fantastic piece taking you three years to get it out, and then someone's just published something really similar, and then you've got to reposition the whole article. You don't want to do that. Uh, proofing and editing, pay attention to the details. I said that in my thesis, professionally proofread, came back from the printer, opened it just because, you know, you do, you're like, oh, middle, the first page I opened, there was a typo. And I'm like, oh, clear it out. So like, really, don't ever, once you've submitted, do not go back to your article again. <laughs> like, after, like 10 minutes later, I don't know what, it's, it, I don't know why we do that. We submit it and then we just want to look at it again. And that's when we find the mistake. So if you're going to do that, just do it before you send it in. Not, not after, okay? Particularly, um, and make sure you spell your name. Make sure you're aware of whether the journal is blind to peer review. Health journals are not blind. They know your name, you know the authors, the reviewers' names, but marketing is not like that. So you need to know whether, whether to leave your name or, or not, okay? It's quite important. All right. Okay, so we're at the end. So last slide, what is, the, what is one thing that you've now learned um, that's your takeaway? And um, if you've got any questions in the remaining like couple of minutes. Yeah, well, there was one that came through earlier yep. um, from Katie. She asked, how many times did you try resubmitting before deciding to add your paper to the graveyard? Um, I think probably minimum eight. I will find, I, I actually believe every paper there is a one for it, right? But often it's, am I willing to put it into a Q3 or Q4 journal? Or do I need to do I have the time or energy to take it into another discipline where I'm maybe applying a marketing concept to something? Um, but I am persistent. I'm very persistent. I've got articles I'm going to revisit now that are 10 years old, so they're now longitudinal studies. In fact, I've got one that I've got data every 10 years. Yeah, seriously, it's an entrepreneurship paper. I did it in my honors. I did it 10 years later, so it's now like a 40-year paper. Um, which I will actually, I'm coming up to the next 10 years, so I will collect it. So now I can track over time, which is always interesting, right? Got it bounced a couple of times in the at the 30-year mark, so or 20 year mark or wherever it was. Um, so now I will revisit that. But I believe every paper can find a home. Hmm. It's like every animal. You know, you just gotta look hard enough or be willing to keep reworking it until eventually. But I I have given up it. Now that I'm saying it, I'm going to go back and have a look at my publication graveyard folder. Um, is there anyone online who wanted to unmute themselves and ask a question as well? I don't have anything else in the chat. A couple of comments thanking you and saying they've got to run. Um, yep. And then you've got some things filtering through there as well. Okay, so we can see lots of takeaways, um, the deconstruction. Uh, you can upvote things as well if it's um, the same as... Um, I would mention also the recording and the slides will be available sort of in the next couple of days. So if you want to revisit yeah. these materials and click the links, they'll be there for you as well. Yeah, that's great. So picking up on some of the tools that I've, I've, I've recommended, like the Manchester University um, Phrase Bank and Bloom's Taxonomy, they're all things that kind of, sometimes we know about, but we forget. And I've got to say, every time I give this presentation, I go, oh, that's right. You know, so I forget, <laughs> I forget as well. So it's always good to keep going back over this and to be explicit about our writing. Okay, well, if there's no further questions, thank you all very much for joining. Um, oh, wow, bang on time. Bang how, on time. How, how awesome is that? Thank you, and um, uh, the Best Centre will share the resources. Uh, do feel free to pass them on to, uh, to people. Thank you very much for coming along.